Good afternoon. This is Vicki Clutie and I'm coming to you live from the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. And today we're going to visit with Jonathan Frembling, the, cura the head curator. Of <laughs> it's a mouthful. Okay. Uh, uh, head archivist and Gentling curator at the Eamon Carter Museum. Uh, so, I, I think today, at least for my part, uh, I'd like to talk about our collections and give you a sense of what it is that uh, we're going to be taking a look at in a broad sense, uh, and hopefully introduce you to some of the uh, resources and assets that we have available that will hopefully be of interest and value to you in your research. So, I'm going to do this via PowerPoint, so let me pull that up. And let's get that shared. There we go. It should come. Yep. There we go. All right. Wonderful. All right. So, uh, the Amy Carter Museum is a museum of American art. Uh, and so, uh, we really only do American art 1800 to roughly 1960. So, it's about 160 years of American art history and culture. Uh, we don't do ultra contemporary generally, and we don't do early colonial, for example. Uh, so, our collections are fairly narrow, uh, but what you're going to find within that uh, that range are truly massed works of uh, their type. So let's start with the art collection first. Uh, this gives you a sense of what the galleries would look like if uh, you choose to visit us. Uh, we are open, uh, pandemic aside, uh, so please do visit us uh, at your convenience. Uh, we do social distancing and all that, so it should be a safe uh, experience, but uh, there's wonderful things to say. So let's take a look at some of the broad categories of material we have quickly. Uh, so within sculpture, uh, we have a, a fairly uh, impressive sculptural collection. And the key with all of our art is that uh, almost without exception, uh, the works that we have represent the example of that piece. Uh, sculpture is a, a duplicative form. It's like photography. There are more than one copy of any given uh, image, or in this case, sculpture. Uh, but our copies are the ones that represent the, the quintessential type of that piece. So, for example, Daniel Chester French's Benediction on the left uh, is the piece that he chose to keep for himself. Uh, he designed uh, this as a monument for troops that were killed in World War I. Uh, it ultimately is never built in France, which is where it was intended to go. Uh, so this small-scale model uh, of the planned larger piece is the one he kept and used as the memorial marker in the family church for his mother. Uh, the church was torn down, and so it went onto the market, and we were able to acquire it for the museum. So this is an example of the piece that the artist chose to keep for himself and uh, use as a, an important memento of his family's existence. So it's not just any copy, it's the copy. Uh, similarly, the John Quincy Adams work Friedman on the right, uh, there are multiple copies of this, but uh, it's a magnificent piece that was uh, created in 1863. It's celebrating the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, you know, freeing of slaves during the Civil War. Uh, and so it's a really magnificent piece for a couple of reasons in that uh, unlike many images uh, of uh, African Americans in this period who are usually supplicating or asking to be freed, this is an image of a black man freeing himself. It's a statement of, of strength. Uh, and it's a really cool piece in person to see, uh, you know, when you come and visit. Uh, but what's interesting about it is this is the copy that was given to given to the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. Uh, they are the uh, first African American uh, Civil War unit uh, to serve in the Civil War. And interestingly, it's the unit that's uh, kind of memorialized in the movie Glory, if you want to see their exploits. But again, here it is, a iconic piece of American sculpture given to an iconic American uh, military regiment uh, in celebration of the Mads Patient Proclamation. Similarly with painting, you have uh, really fine examples uh, in the art collection that represent singular types. So the John Lafarge on the left. Uh, Lafarge is not someone who usually worked in pastel. So this is an unusual piece for him in that um, it's a work on paper and it's in a medium that he doesn't use often, but it's a really abstract kind of very loosely executed, uh, uh, almost impressionistic style uh, piece, which is unusual for him. So it's you know really an iconic, singular example of his work. Uh, and on the right, you have William Harnett's Attention Company, uh, which 
arguably is one of my favorite uh, pieces for a couple reasons. Uh, so it's a trompe l'oeil. Uh, hopefully you'll encounter that term in, in a bit, but trompe l'oeil literally translate to fool the eye. The idea is that this image is supposed to be so photorealistic, you're supposed to look at it and go, oh, that's a real kid standing against a real wall. Now, most trompe l'oeils don't include people. Uh, it's just really, really uncommon because it's very, very hard to get that photorealism uh, to work. It's usually easier with uh, non-living still lives and that sort of thing. So it's unusual that Harnett, who was the master of the trompe l'oeil uh, idea, chooses to include an African-American child in the image. Uh, and that's the key. It's not just any person, it's a black kid. Uh, so this is really unusual uh, as far as content, uh, both in the medium and who he chooses to include. And what's fascinating about it is, it's uh, is talking about or capturing a, a really interesting history uh, or a piece of history in Philadelphia's uh, um, kind of overall history. During the Civil War, you had uh, the African-American community uh, take up arms to defend the city from uh, Southern forces moving north to try to overrun the city, knowing that if the South was able to conquer Philadelphia, they were likely to be uh, all put into bondage. Uh, they, you know, they take up arms to defend the city. And so Harnett is, uh, is referring to this really interesting singular moment during the Civil War with this image of this child taking up arms or pretending to take up arms in this case uh, and getting ready to march for his freedom. Really cool piece. So with photography, same thing. Uh, you have works like Elliot Porter on the uh, uh, left. Uh, he works almost exclusively in color, and you have artists like Laura Gilpin who is working in black and white. So this represents the bookends of, of photography, you know, color versus black and white. So, you know, it's interesting in our collections, uh, the nearly 300,000 works of art in our collection, uh, to uh, explore how photography is really a quintessentially American medium. Now, of course, everybody makes photographs, but uh, you know the U.S. has really produced some superlative artists and some uh, you know, really magnificent captures of especially the American landscape, as you can see here. Really cool stuff. Uh, so the gallery is open, uh, as you can see here on the hours. So please do come and visit us to see the art in person. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. We are free and open to the public, so there's no cost. Uh, so it, it is a wonderful way to uh, in, enjoy wonderful art as part of this class. All right, so let's move to the special collection stuff. You have to wear a mask. Oh, yes, please do wear a mask. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, so uh, let's move to library and archives collection, which is where uh, I primarily live. So this is the reading room. Uh, this is just on the other side of the, uh, the broadcast wall that we've got here. So if you wish to come in and do some research at the museum, this is the place you could come and do that. Uh, as you can see, we have a nice reference collection on here, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. We have uh, about 150,000 volumes uh, in our book and periodical collection uh, just out of view in this room. So there's so much more to be had here, and our catalog is all searching along the line. So there's our library catalog and the stacks to give you a sense of what 150,000 volumes looks like. Uh, so uh, cartermuseum.org, research hyphen Carter slash library, and that'll get you the catalog. And you can browse what we have online and say, hey, I want these six or seven items. We'll have them here waiting for you when you come to visit. We are not a circulating library, so you do have to come and visit in person to use the materials, and you can't take it with you. But uh, you're welcome to photograph, scan, copy. We have the equipment to do that. Uh, so if you do find just that perfect thing, there's all sorts of ways to uh, take it with you, even if you can't actually take the book itself. Now, the reason this is significant is that uh, books are art objects in their own right. So here's a couple of examples of this as an idea. So we have some uh, historic copies of the Bible. Now, uh, the Bible, of course, often is illustrated. And so, especially in the 19th century, you had major American artists contributing uh, images for the illustrated copies of the Bible. So here we have uh, uh, one of the frontispieces to a copy, an 1831 edition of the Bible uh, by James Smiley, uh, that's looking at a work that's in our collection, Thomas Cole's Garden of Eden. So this is a, a oil on canvas painting that Smiley then turns into a illustration for the Bible. So it's an interesting way to see how art influences uh, you know, bookmaking. 
Along with that, we have John James Audubon. Uh, his Birds of America are, uh, you know, kind of one of these landmark uh, publications in, in American history. Uh, it's really the first time that an artist goes and tries to document the natural wonders of the United States. And this is really early on. He starts this uh, right around the turn of the 19th century uh, and is really starting to try to get it published about 1800, uh, 1806 uh, through about 16 or thereabouts. Uh, and so this is really his first attempt to show what uh, the birds of the United States look like, because previous to this, no one had really done a, a encyclopedic survey of the natural wonders of this country. Uh, and the assumption was, at least in Europe, is that uh, anything in the United States was kind of a secondary or uh, uh, degenerate version of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the wonders of the old world, uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, there was certainly a, a certain amount of um, uh, bigotry is shown in that regard. Uh, you know how everything in the old world is always going to be better than what uh, what you could find in the new. And with Audubon uh, showing that this was absolutely not the case, uh, it opened a lot of eyes. Uh, and so we have multiple copies of this. So if you want to see this landmark publication, which these are all hand colored plates, so each and every one is unique because some poor soul had to go in there and paint each one of these one by one in every copy of the book. So some poor uh, body had to paint the red and then the black and then the white and the green, color by color, page by page, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So, but they did it off of the print. Yeah, so it starts with a black and white print, uh, and then uh, essentially assembly line. Usually, it was the artist's family. They would sit down, and you know, mom would do red, and, you know, daughter would do blue, son would do green, etc. So you do, you fill in your part, and you pass the image down to the next person. You do it a hundred times to get the book done, then you bind the thing up, and off it goes. But yeah, they all start as black and white, uh, you know, lined uh, prints, and then they have to be colored in by hand. So yeah, pretty complicated, but that's the only way you could do it. You could not publish in color for uh, decades uh, uh, after this. So this is this is an early way of getting color images. And of course, color is really important when you're talking about birds. You need to know what the plumage colors are. That's why that's why they went to this trouble. Well, so in addition to that, uh, the books as art objects, because books can be art in their own right. We also have microfilm collections now. If you haven't used microfilm, it's not the most fun stuff to use, but it does contain a wealth of material that you cannot find in uh, other media. So don't assume that something that's online is the only or the sum of what there is to find. There's so much more out there that's not digitized. And a good example of that is we are the mid-country repository for the Archives of American Art. The Archives of American Art is the Smithsonian's collection of original artist papers. Uh, what that means is the Smithsonian, the museum in Washington, D.C., has gone around the country, borrowed uh, original artist papers from, uh, from across the U.S. history, uh, copied them on microfilm, and returned the originals back. And so what it does is it gathers all these archival collections from across the country into a single place on microfilm. So you don't have to go around the country one by one saying, hey, I want to read Georgia O'Keeffe's letter, who's in the image on the left here. I want to read her letters. Uh, I have to go to Abiquiu to look at one group. I have to go to the New Mexico Museum to look at another, et cetera, et cetera. It's all here together in one spot. It's just on microfilm. You won't be looking at paper. You'll be looking at uh, uh, essentially photographed images of that paper. So it's 20 million primary documents on microfilm. It is a treasure trove of primary research. So this is just a wonderful asset. When you get uh, around to writing those papers, think of this as something to, to use. Nothing beats uh, hearing the artists in their own words. It's really pretty amazing. In addition to that, you have newspapers from uh, rare books on microfilm. So these are things that are almost impossible to find in hard copy. They've been uh, photographed and you can look at them virtually through this. Uh, we have a copier scanner that allow you to copy these and take them with you. So it's kind of nice. All right, so reading room hours, if you do wish to visit uh, and do research here, as you can see, uh, they are similar to the uh, the overall museum's hours. We generally open an hour later and close an hour earlier than the overall museum. Gives us time to get set up in the morning and close shop in the evenings. Uh, and I would like to point out, we do have Saturday hours, so if you can't get in during the weekday, this is a good time to do it. Uh, and we also are open late on Thursday nights uh, for the same reason. So there's a couple of really nice options to get you in here uh, based on what your schedule is. And don't hesitate to drop us a line either through our website or giving us a call and uh, if you have any questions. So.
Let's move to archives. Archives represents the primary document. So just like the Archives of American Art, which is on microfilm, we have the actual papers of uh, uh, about 17 different artists and uh, hundreds of linear feet of research materials on historical topics. So unlike microfilm, uh, these are going to be the real things. These are the actual documents. So for example, we have a historic uh, Fort Worth photography collection. So this is a view of the city of Fort Worth, circa about 1879 or thereabouts. That's the second courthouse for the city. Uh, this is market day, so you can see everybody gathered together with their produce and whatnot that they produce on the outlying farm and they're coming into town to sell. Fort Worth was a mighty small place since uh, 1879, not nearly as big as it is today. So within the special or uh, the archives collection, we have special collections that represent uh, a variety of different topics. So we have historical things. So on the left, you have uh, one of the uh, letter pages from an early Texas settler, a lady named Sarah Ann Lily Hardinge. Uh, so this is a letter that her brother wrote to her in 1838, talking about the wonders of uh, Texas and uh, the reason she should come here and what she should expect. So uh, there's kind of interesting historical things in it uh, that can be discovered there. The key about all our special collections is, is that uh, they almost always connect back to art directly or indirectly. So in this case, Sarah Ann Lily Hardinge is a diarist and a, a letter writer. So we have the letters where you can hear her words, but she's also a painter. And so she paints views of what Texas looks like in the 1850s and early 1860s. So it's really interesting to be able to take the uh, story of what she's saying and then marry it to the image that she makes. So you get the, the story plus picture, hard to be. Uh, and that's gonna be true of a lot of the uh, materials that we have. In addition to that, we have a variety of objects. So these include everything from artist made or artist used materials. So this is a camera lens made by one of our artists, Carl Struess. He designs and uh, markets this particular uh, you know, piece of equipment. Uh, we have uh, the artist used cameras, we have 19th century materials, uh, etc. Uh, we have artist archives, that really brings us to this. So we have the papers, so letters, diaries, scrapbooks, this kind of thing, of uh, eight different photographers. So we have on the left, we have Elliot Porter, who's one of our uh, photographers, talking to Dorothea Lang, one of the other big names in American photography. Uh, we have the records of the Roman Bronze Works, which is the premier art bronze foundry in the United States in the 20th century. So when you go around anytime you see a bronze sculpture that's made in the 20th century, probably 90% of the time, they're all going to be done by this one company, Roman Bronze Works, which was in New York. Uh, they went out of business and we acquired all of their foundry records. Uh, it's important for our research to be able to go in and look at uh, that first step in the creation of an object, the idea of provenance, the, the chain of events that lead from the artist conceiving of an idea all the way through who owns it today. That's provenance. Uh, and this represents the first step in that process. The artist talking to the foundry saying, hey, I want to make this, this sculpture. What's it going to cost? How long is it going to take? These kinds of things. And you can find those in these records. We also have regional artists like the Fort Worth Circle. They were active in the 40s and 50s. Uh, and more contemporary artists like Scott and Stuart Gentlin. They were active from the 60s through their deaths in the early 2000s. Uh, and so these are artists whose papers we have. But in addition to that, we also have a large amount of their art, hundreds of pieces of regionally made art, looking often at regional subjects at least on the left, and then on the right, you have a portrait of uh, Andrew Wyeth of the uh, Wyeth clan, who are quite famous on the East Coast as illustrators, painters, that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, we have internal records. Uh, so of maybe kind of not great interest to put this particular group. Uh, you have exhibition records and uh, the kinds of exhibitions we've put on over the years. We have all of those records, and then the stuff that we produce that talk about us as a museum. So let's look at a couple of special collections or ideas. We have Texana. So Texana, here's a good example from the Scott and Stuart Gatling papers. You can see an artist creating or laying out the composition for a portrait. Uh, so he starts with a sketch first, lays out this grid. So when he comes to paint it uh, formally on canvas at a much larger scale, he can use this as a guide on uh, the scaling and reproduce this manually without being able to scan it and then print it onto the canvas and then painting it in. This is how you do this old school. You know, you, you, you transfer it by a grid pattern. You know, I know this eye needs to be this size to this size, and then you transfer that to uh, on a larger scale to the new to the new media. So you can see all sorts of interesting artist techniques within these kinds of papers, in addition to the letters and that kind of thing. 
back to salient sorry analytically hardened nice example there that's the full letter giving you a sense of what's going on uh, we have the papers of Eamon Carter, the Persian, the museum's namesake. Uh, so he was a booster for Fort Worth in the region. So much of the aviation industry uh, in the area, as well as the museum, the Fort Worth Star Telegram, um, uh, etc. All of that is due to Eamon Carter. And we have his papers. So this particular one is him uh, uh, going to world uh, out to Europe during World War II to tour around the war zones to see what's going on. So here he's got Eamon Carter's the guy holding the hat. So he's uh, drag, being dragged around by uh, a three-star General Simpson, uh, Secretary of uh, War Patterson, etc. So he didn't go with just anybody. He went with the big cheese. So kind of thought. Historical collections, real quick. Roman bronze, we briefly talked about. But that's the client card in Roman bronze for Eamon Carter commissioning works. So it's a double connection to us right there. Uh, the, this is a landscape uh, painted in 1807 by two, uh, one of uh, two English brothers that come to the United States in the early, early Republic. Uh, they tour the country uh, from 1806 through 1808 and see all sorts of wonderful, interesting things. They paint these watercolors of what they see, and they keep diaries. So this is like Sarah Ann Lily Harden just about uh, 40 years earlier. So it's a, another way to encounter what, the, uh, what this country is like uh, before a lot of the Western migration has taken place. Uh, we have uh, cross-border exchanges. So we did exhibitions on the Canadian Mounties, the Texas Rangers, and the Mexican Rurales. All essentially the same idea. They are mounted police forces, kind of fun. Uh, so here you have a group of uh, Mexican Morales, uh, their formal group portrait here. Uh, they're in their Sunday best, for lack of a better term, getting, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, showing off their their kind of regalia. And of course, I would doubt they don't go out on patrol wearing this particular outfit. Uh, these are a little fancy for daily wear. Uh, so photographers, we briefly discussed. So. See here, uh, it's Elliot Porter again. So he, he's a scientist by training. So it's another way to look at uh, his technique and how he achieves uh, his beautiful photographs. As a scientist, he keeps a card for every photograph he ever makes. Uh, and so what he does is he's documenting in detail the chemical composition of the exact uh, kind of chemical bath that he's using to develop the photographs. So he's going to add this much of this chemical, exactly this much of this one, et cetera, et cetera. And that way, if he makes a print of the same original negative, each print could be slightly different based on the chemical composition, and he can pick which one he likes best and make more of that one using these essentially recipe cards. Really crazy stuff. And to give you a sense, there are probably 100,000 of these things, all hand filled out one by one for each and every photograph he makes. It's and look, he has the the f-stop and everything on there. Yep, it's, it's really meticulous. This is, this is a scientist at work right here. Really super meticulous stuff. Ah, and on the other end of the spectrum, this is uh, from the uh, Nell Dore papers. Nell Dore uh, is also a photographer, but she's no scientist. Uh, she is more of a traditional artist in that um, she's interested in uh, kind of the aesthetics of things. So she's friends with uh, the children's book illustrator, Tasha Tudor. Uh, they both love collecting uh, antique dolls. And so uh, Tasha Tudor and Nell Dore exchange Christmas cards every year. And they don't just exchange Christmas cards between themselves. They also give each other's doll families Christmas cards. So the big card at the top is for Nell. The bottom cards below are for the doll family that she has. And so those little Christmas cards at the bottom are actually about the size of a quarter. So they're about a one, one inch square, give or take. So these are super tiny, but each one hand painted and inside they have a, a separate little message for the doll family, all carefully handwritten in tiny, tiny script. Really crazy fun stuff. This is what makes artists interesting. I just watched a documentary about um, Tasha Tudor. Oh, really? It's on, it's on Amazon. Fascinating way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, live for a long time too. So uh, we also have documentation of uh, you know historic events. So this is the 1951 Aspen Conference. So this was the the gathering of American photographers post World War II to really talk about what uh, what they were going to do with photography now that uh, the war and some of these big events where photojournalism had been done. So it's like what is fine art photography going to be? 
This particular conference leads to the creation of Aperture Magazine, which is still one of the big names in photo uh, magazines to this day. Uh, and really have gathered in this image uh, important people like Ansel Adams, Elliot Porter, Dorothea Lang, Bernice Abbott, Laura Gilpin, Beaumont Nancy Newhall, and then all these major uh, you know, magazine and book publishers as well. I mean, just a treasure trove of different uh, individuals who go on to shape uh, photography for decades to come. And it all comes out of this conference. And this is an artist's papers because Laura Gilpin, who is the lady who's hiding underneath the camera's hood uh, on the uh, right-hand side there, she's there and she photographs them doing stuff, the little candid snapshots of them talking shop. So it's a way to encounter the artist firsthand. So we also have artists use materials as we discussed earlier. So we can, um, artists use camera there. Uh, we have tools, for example, uh, one of the uh, bronze foundry workmen uh, from Roman Bronze Works. So those are tools that are used to uh, finish a uh, bronze sculpture, remove off all the rough, rough edges and that kind of thing. 19th century materials. So these are actual, uh, you know, what, 100 and 120 or 130 year old paint pots and pencils and brushes and toolkits and this kind of thing. This is the art and materials that the artists use in the period. And that's important because it allows us to understand the chemical, chemical compositions of the uh, items uh, that they create. And a good example of this is Russell creates this, this really interesting little watercolor of uh, a, a, an Indian family uh, talking around uh, their campfire within their teepee. So it's a little campfire going on there. You have a grandfather talking to his grandkids, telling them stories. And it's a, it's a really lovely picture. But uh, what's interesting about it is if you look at it under UV light, you discover that the teepee uh, is full of smoke. The smoke doesn't exist anymore because uh, um, Russell used uh, a certain kind of China white that's very uh, you know, photo or light sensitive. And so over the succeeding uh, nearly 100 years since it was painted, that all that uh, the white smoke in the teepee has disappeared. It's, it's literally gone, become invisible because it's photosensitive and it's gone. You can only see it under UV light. And so this is a way to understand those chemical compositions. We can actually get one of the pots of uh, uh, China white and you know make those comparisons to figure out what happened to that picture. So this is Russell's kit or just I a kit? No, th this is just kits we bought uh, uh, from uh, using the same materials as he used, okay. as well as other, other artists in our collection. All right, so let's look at a couple of collections in a little more detail. So this is why these matter. Uh, so this is a fun example of this. So uh, this is a photo or a painting uh, made by a young uh, Swiss-born artist named Peter Rindisbacher. Uh, he is a settler that comes to uh, comes to North America uh, in the uh, what about 1819. Uh, he decides he's going to settle in the Hudson or the Selkirk colony, which is up on the Hudson's Bay in northern Canada. Uh, and he is uh, basically lives there uh, during the period where a guy named um, uh, Andrew Bulger is the governor of the, the colony. Now, Bulger had previously served in the War of 1812. And so he, uh, Bulger asked Rindisbacher to paint images of his military career. It's a way for him to promote uh, his military career so he can get a, a promotion. He can send these pictures back to London and say, hey, look at the wonderful job I'm doing. Aren't I great? Uh, and so these images capture moments from uh, Bulger's military career during the War of 1812. So in this particular instance, uh, Andrew Bulger is uh, the only guy not wearing a hat. He's the red-headed fellow uh, in uh, British military uniform over on the right-hand side near the gate of the fort. Uh, and so what you have in this image is he's explaining to his Native American allies, all the guys in the middle there, that uh, we've won the war. Uh, remember, uh, this is the war the U.S. decides they want to invade Canada. Doesn't go well. We get our teeth thoroughly kicked in by the British. Uh, we are driven out of Canada, and the British come all the way down south and, and burn the White House in Washington, D.C. So we do really, really badly in this war. And so Andrew Bulger is part of that, uh, that story on the British side. So he's part of the uh, group that uh, you know, defeats the American forces. So he's basically telling his Native American allies that, hey, we did really well. We won the war, except... Well, unfortunately, there was a treaty signed in Europe called the Treaty of Ghent that basically says everything goes back to the way it was at the beginning of the war. Uh, you have to give up everything you won uh, because of the, uh, all the events taking place in Europe, of which this was just a small part. And so although we won, we kind of lost. So 
we're going to have to leave now. Uh, and so all the British pack up. They take the, the British flag down off the fort and they march away, leaving the poor Native Americans standing around, uh, you know, flummoxed uh, about the, the stupidity of Europeans. Uh, and they are now responsible and uh, um, in, uh, under the governance of the American forces, they're much hated uh, Americans uh, on the left. Those three guys that are on the left are U.S. Uh, troops coming to take custody of the fort. So it's a really fascinating moment in American history that you can capture through an image like this. And there are almost no images of this war. I mean, this is not a war that was photographed. Photography didn't exist yet. And so being able to have an image of these activities in real time is so important. And this is why we have this collection of really magnificent things. We have all of the letters and diaries and uh, you know, kind of reports from uh, Andrew Boulder's career where he's talking about the events that take place during the War of 1812. And this war shapes the border between the United States and Canada. We would be, our, the shape of our country would be wildly different if we had won that war. Uh, and so this is just a really important uh, uh, historical collection that's supplemented with these magnificent and really rare images. So again, story plus picture, hard to be. Say it time and again. Now, it's not always about history. There's also art, of course. So uh, we have the papers of Carl Struess. He's the youngest member of the Alfred Stieglitz group in New York, the Photo Secession. Uh, and they're really uh, you know, fascinated by art, uh, photography as a fine art form. They make the case that photography is comparable to painting and sculpture. You, you, you uh, have to be an artist to create a, a truly magnificent photograph. Anybody can take a photograph, but not anybody can make art. And so really they're there making that case. Really, they do such a magnificent job that uh, America really dominates photography for, for at least decades, and arguably still does. Uh, and so this is an image that Carl Struess makes while he's part of that, uh, that really elite group of American photographers in New York around the turn of the century. So this one's made in 1911. Notice that beautiful, soft focus, almost impressionistic, uh, um, you know, kind of hazy feel to the, the photograph. They love this particular style. This is pictorialist photography. Uh, just magnificent. We have a you know a really large collection of his uh, early works. But what's fun about Struess is that he enlisted in the U.S. Army during World War One, uh, and after he's discharged, uh, he decides he doesn't want to do photography anymore. He wants to go out to this uh, little town uh, called Hollywood in California because they're doing this new thing called the movies. Uh, and so he gets involved in the earliest days of the motion picture industry here in the United States. And so here's this one artist who is there at the, with the important group of American photographers in New York and then goes to Hollywood and becomes a founding member of this important group of American movie makers. So he's there for these two quintessentially American art forms, really cool stuff. And so we have all of Carl Struess's work on early movies. So he is the guy standing next to the camera walking down the steps in the really long uh, overcoat. Uh, and so this is him creating a really cool technical shot in a movie called Sunrise, The Song of Two Humans. It's a beautiful film. Is that one you're going to show this year? I, I don't think I'll show it. Okay. It's just too hard to get it to everyone. No problems. Well, it's a magnificent film if you have a chance to see it. It's a silent film, so it takes a little getting used to, but the cinematography in it is truly gorgeous. And you can see uh, Struess's handiwork in that, that early pictorialist uh, style that he has translates into the film uh, and, and just gets these you know, really lush images. Really, really cool stuff. So, and the first use of green screen. Yeah, green screen over there. That's, he's a technical innovator. He's a really, uh, really kind of a wizard when it comes to figuring out unique and interesting ways to, uh, you know, create new uh, shots, new ways of uh, showing an image. So in this particular scene uh, in the movie, uh, the uh, lead, two lead actors, Janet Gaynor and George O'Brien, the two uh, folks are on the left side, uh, they're walking through traffic. But of course, they're not going to ask the actors to actually do that. And so Struess figured out how to add the traffic after the effect or after the fact using a green screen. So that neutral big backdrop that the two workmen are holding up, he basically projects the traffic onto that uh, in post-production. So this is this is him you know, really kind of creating new technologies. Kind of cool. So that's another example of how uh, you know our artist archives can be uh, explored and enjoyed. Now you'll notice that this is the room that we're in currently. So this is the Gettling study room. 
This is a room that is here for you to look at art that's not currently on display. So when you visit, take a look at all the really cool stuff that we picked out and put on the walls. But remember, it's only about a, a couple hundred pieces from a collection that's 300,000 uh, pieces strong. So there's so much more to be seen. Uh, and so what this room can do is we can uh, pull things from the vault that are not currently on display and put them on this wall so that you can enjoy them. So this is a way to really explore the deep holdings of the museum. All you have to do is ask. It's really super easy. So do keep us in mind in that regard, and I really hope we will see you soon. Oops. That is study room out, just so you know. They're the same as the reading room. And that is it. Okay, three dots. Is this it? Where's the camera? Stop recording. There it is. I think that went well. I hope so. Let me stop sharing. Let's see, where's the stop sharing part? Oh, yes. Oh, I think I did shut down, didn't I? There, but the red light's still on for you. The red, so that means you were recording also. You just didn't have the microphone on. Yes, yeah, stop.